This is Cameron Haynes from Team Realtree. This is Kurt Wells, equipment editor at Bowhunter Magazine. This is Sean Launch Monster from Team SNT. This is Ralph Cantrell from the Arthur Choice. This is Travis T. Bone Turner from Bone Collectors on Bowcast. 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 Welcome to another episode of Bowcast. This is the Archery Podcast with the new school archer in mind. Bowcast covers everything from tips, techniques, and archery technology that will help raise your success in the field. And now, here are your hosts covering the straight shot. Lean forward slightly. Look straight at the speaker. And listen with a sparkle in your eye. As though you might be thinking, gee, this is the most wonderful thing I ever heard in all my life. Bowcasters, welcome to another episode of FMP Bowcast. I'm your host, Kenny Simpson, and this is a big one. This is episode 200 for us. We're extremely excited about this one. We have Lee and Tiffany Lukoski joining us here in a little bit. They're going to talk a little bit about deer hunting, and they're going to actually take some time to answer your questions that you guys sent in to us. So uh, sit back and enjoy that. Before we get started with them, I want to let everybody know that this episode is brought to you by our friends at Backwoods Life. Now, if you don't watch Backwoods Life, I'm sorry, you're missing out on one of the best shows on outdoor television. It's just, it's amazing. I love it. They know how to have fun. They know how to represent themselves well. And you know what? I love the guys there. So thank you so much, Backwoods Life, for bringing us this episode um, but before we get to it, I just want to throw this out there. Our good friend and longtime listener Bryce Nelson from Utah has been recently diagnosed with cancer, and there's been a fund set up to help ease the financial burden of his treatments. And you can actually find that on our Facebook page. We have it shared on there. So if you're feeling inclined, please, please check that out and uh, hopefully maybe make a donation to help Bryce and his family out. But Bryce, feel better, man. We love you. We're pulling for you, and our prayers are definitely with you. So uh, kid cancer in the ass, man. We're all pulling for you here at Bowcast. Uh, we're going to take a little break, and we'll be right back with Lee and Tiffany. <laughs> And the beautiful state of Iowa is Lee and Tiffany Lukoski. How are you guys doing today? Really good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having us. I'm doing fantastic. I, Lee, I know you were talking a little bit. You're multitasking right now, so uh, fill everybody in on what you have going on. Oh, just checking trail cameras. You know, we finally got some snow here in, in Iowa, which is great for us, uh, especially for, you know, shed season coming up. We found... You know, quite a few actually found one of the big ones today, even on our snowmobiles. But when you get snow out, all those deer basically, it's no more foraging and eating acorns and everything anywhere they want to. They basically have to pile into our food plots. That's really what we want. The more snow, the better, you know, this time of year, it just keeps them in the same spot. You know, they don't go very far. So, you know, you go out and you find the shed. So about every couple of days, I'll go out and check all the cameras and see if any of our big ones drop. So if they have, you know, I get out look for them right away before they get chewed up or anything so i'm just going through pic, you know camera pictures right now so i'm going to stay focused you that, to hear me scream or anything I, 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 there's a new giant that showed up i apologize in advance no yeah I, I think we'll forgive you for that <laughs> one uh, i have to ask how many trail cameras do you guys run oh man I, maybe i don't know three to four hundred i guess oh my gosh something like that yeah it's a lot so it's <laughs> oh. not it's it's not anything you do in a day you know you just pick a couple farms maybe get to one or two farms in a day you know um you know to get around all the places and check all of them follow the cards and then you know you usually do you know two one day and then you know wait a couple of days maybe get another two and then by the time you finish you know getting around to all 10 farms then you use time to start the next one so it's it, it's always you're always going you know, it's always the time you can always go check cameras now, Tiffany, how many times does Lee make you go out and pull the cards? 
You know, I, I have a few farms that I always check. I always check our home one, and then I always check usually the farms that I'm hunting. But, I mean, really, especially during hunting season, it's, it's all we can do to even get the cards back to them so you can actually see them. So I'm happy to help out on that, though. Well, that's yeah, I'll, that's a good thing. I'll send her out on a few. Yeah, you know, the he has. Like at our home <laughs> farm and stuff that she's around more that the, she has her farm that she normally always checks them on. Nice and they use the four lakes with, like, you know, where I can run our dogs back at and, and stuff like that. I said It's funny, though, because it's like he has these set cards way more than he has when he put the cameras up. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> I don't know what to tell you on that. Maybe you guys can uh, arm wrestle over who gets to set the cameras <laughs> next year or something. But it's, it's so funny, though, because, like, the way I put him up, he's like, what are you trying to get a picture of? I'm like, God, I don't know. When I looked at it, it looked like it would be perfect. <laughs> yeah, you can always tell if she sets them up or somebody else. That's why I, I usually do everything. I usually put them up because I'll go, you know, you're all excited to go see a new camera and see, you know, what's been coming out there or something. And they'll be pointed like, you know, 90 degrees up in the air. I'm like, well, if a duck happens to be flying over and a deer walking by at the same <laughs> time, maybe possibly we might get a picture of it. So it's, um, it's better if I just do it myself. And at least I know but what I'm you got it. I keep flowers, but bring them back to you most of the time. Yeah, I, yeah, it's not too bad. You get a few like that every year, and then like, oh wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I, you know what, Lee, be thankful that you have help with the cards because I, I have no help myself. So everything's, <laughs> it, it's usually me going out and do the stuff while she either, I don't know, looks at her phone or thinks about where to hang a stand and I'm like, can you grab a couple cards? Is it going to kill you? Can you move this camera? But it's, it's always, uh, no, that's like not her. the case. Tiffany is not much for sitting around. She's, if we're out doing something, while she's working. I will give her that. She's like, you know, if we're putting up stands and I got to take her over any of our camera guys or anything, it's like, you know, I'm up trying to get stands up. She'll have the, the next stand out ready to go strap about the you know about the size you need it and everything else it's like we have a good system we've been doing it for 15 years together so we pretty much have a, a good system down yeah that, that was, that's always a good thing go ahead tiff no i he's right there. i mean we are a great team when we're out there no doubt about it and yeah very rarely am i ever just sitting around i slow down a tad right now just because i'm almost nine months pregnant but other than that i mean, <laughs> catch up i hang in there pretty good so yep, uh how's, he's, how's he's not cracking the whip like he used to He's not, no, no, he's got, you know, when, when it was just him and I out there, it used to, he used to have to crack the whip pretty good. But now we've got a couple other people that are out there. we got camera guys and stuff, so he's mellowed out a little bit in his old age. <laughs> yeah, especially since you're pregnant, I've given you a free pass on a lot of things, too. I don't think that's going to be all the time. I know, there, it is totally, it's a total truth, though, because there'll be like certain things, he's like, I need you to know we planted a bunch of trees last year and uh, a bunch of apple trees. And I hate this job. I seriously do. Because it's like, he'll be like, I need you to go trim around all the trees because he wants all the weeds cut around them. I'm like, <laughs> can I have a different job? That is the worst job ever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know how that goes. It, there's some jobs and it, it kind of sucks because you just have to do them. But you know yeah. what? Looking back, it's like, man, there'd be, there's so much better stuff to do right now that I could actually enjoy doing. Than that. I know. It's like, like I said, and actually, I wouldn't even mind just trimming them, but you got to take the cages off, and then they get all tangled up, and it's just a pain. It's not my favorite job. Well, you guys <laughs> definitely have a good system down, and the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, with some of the deer you killed, and obviously you've pretty good success rate on other animals other than white-tailed deer. So I have to ask you, how did your season go this year? You going me? Tiffany, how did you take I, that one since I, you had the best had, season? Yeah, I did. I had the best season of my life. I'm like, okay, either A, I'm going to need to stay pregnant all the time, or <laughs> B, I just had a great season. So hopefully it'll continue. But, yeah, I shot two huge elk. I shot an antelope at 80 yards with my bow, a big mule deer. Three huge white tails, biggest white tail of my life this year. A bunch of ducks, a bunch of pheasants, and and we're still going. I just shot a possum the other day. <laughs> yeah, with a with a pistol, by the, with a nine millimeter. Yeah. You gotta keep the you gotta add the possum. But yeah, I mean, we had an awesome year. I mean, we really did. Considering you know we the last couple of years in Iowa, we were hit really hard with EHD, and you know, so you just like God, what's this year going to be like? And this year ended up being one of our best years. I mean, even with 
the guests and buddies that we have come down. But we shot a lot of old deer this year that needed to be shot. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Lee? Uh, I mean, I had a really good year, too. But, you know, we had, yeah, we think about whitetails. And Tiffany shot her, you know, the biggest whitetail of her life of 192 or something. So that kind of trumps everything. But I had a great season, too. I mean, I shot a 200-inch mule deer, you know, right off the bat early. And then shot a big elk. And, uh, you know, I shot three whitetails here. The biggest, and actually my biggest net typical um, whitetail that I've ever shot, too, the 177-inch. Uh, big clean typical so it was you know it was really a good year for us for us all around you know um it's funny you don't seem like you end up saying that almost all the time but you know it, you kind of get your spot honed down and especially like for deer on our farms now you know a lot of these have been you know 10 12 years into the management plan and you know so it seems like every year we say boy we've had one of the best years of our lives and and uh i'm glad that it keeps going that way because it seems like we're it seems like every year we Managed to eke out, you know, some good animals everywhere. So been very lucky that way. That sounds like I'm. I mean, just this is just my take on it, but it sounds like that's a pretty good season. I don't think I'd be complaining about that at all. You guys definitely put down some impressive animals, that's for sure. So congratulations to you both on that. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, for me, that was you know because that, that was the biggest mule deer of my life, and then the biggest net typical. You know, and that's that's saying a lot. You know, you've been deer hunting for 30 years now and you know she's the biggest net typical that's a that's a big deer too and like tiffany said with all the hd we weren't really anticipating a real good year so our deer numbers are down a lot i mean they figured and the, the biologists say you know 40 percent of the deer are gone in iowa and we noticed it i mean there's a lot of them that are gone but you know just we just have to luck out on we have still quite a few that always make it through because we have 10 different farms in three different counties so it's not all just in one spot but but we did a we had a really good year on catching up with those old deer that you know, you know like Wally the one that Tiffany shot she's been hunting them for three years and you know just because they're on your farm doesn't mean that you're going to see them you you know you're talking a seven eight year old deer and you know, some of these older bucks even if they're even if they're management deer you know if you have a we we had uh, Brian Offit from Under Armour game we shot one of our deer that was like ten or eleven years old. Jeez. And even though he's on like 140 inches now, I mean, the best he ever was was maybe high 50, but just a big frame and big mass. He's at a really short point. And, you know, they're deer you have to get out. But just because you say, oh, that deer needs to go, that doesn't mean anyone's ever going to get a bow shot at him, you know, to get him within within range. So we got really lucky on those. Like we had a, a big old deer that my dad shot that we'd been trying to shoot. I missed him two years ago with my bow. And, you know, just every, we've had people hunting that deer for couple of years same thing as brian's and you know a lot of these deer you know just because they're you know only 150 inch or 140 inch you know kind of more management type deer and they get to be six seven years old that doesn't mean they can't go shoot that one you know you can hunt 100 days for those deer and never even see them so you know we got really lucky on shooting some of the old deer on our place that we wanted to, to get out of here so it really worked out good that way we didn't see, we didn't shoot a single four-year-old deer this year and when every year you normally you know some guests come or something like that and you'll have some bigger four-year-old deer and it's like yeah that's okay you know we'll more deer will get hit by cars out on the road than we're going to shoot so you know somebody shoots a four-year-old or even a three-year-old and we don't care it's like hey well, we're just here to have fun and this year since we did lose so many it's like there's no four-year-olds no three-year-olds just five and older try to get rid of some of our you know really old type management deer and we did a really good job at at getting them all but of course we did you know we still shot you know big deer we shot i don't know must have been three or four in the 170s and then tiffany's okay. in the 190 and you know several in the 160s so i mean it, we still shot a lot of good deer too now do you feel or do you have a maybe an opinion on let's say you know you're Obviously, you guys run more trail cameras than I can probably even count, so that has to... Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, that obviously has to be a huge advantage to you, but do you guys feel like there comes a certain age? Like, what's the minimum age you look for in a deer to where you know without a doubt that he's not going to be the caliber of, you know, the the caliber that you're looking for in a white-tailed deer? You can usually tell. I mean... I mean, all deer are different. Cause like like Wally, that the big one that Tiffany shot this year, 
she's been hunting them for several years, but the biggest he ever was was like a 170. And not that that's anything to shake a stick at, but he only had like a 10 inch inside spread. So he was the whole time, I mean, he was kind of almost like a management deer. And he's like, all right, he looked like he had good potential, he had a lot of points. That's why I forgot his name, Wally. He looked like a big wall of points at three years old. And every year he just never really blew like you thought he would. And so he was almost kind of like a management deer. And all of a sudden, eight and a half, he goes from, you know, 100 and maybe 170 at his best to, you know, 192 inch deer, you know, and that's at eight and a half years old. So, but that's normally not the case. Even with him, he had a lot of points, you know, 10 on a side. And I think it was 23 total points this year. But so they always have that potential. The more stickers you have and splits and stuff, that, you know, there's a lot of stickers at the base and stuff. But a lot of these deer, like by four, if they're just short timed and, you know, eight points or nine points on that, you know, they're never going to get much bigger. Even, even, if, even at that point, though, at three and four, there's lots that I know are never going to be big deer. But still, we always get them till five because, you know, we have a lot of friends and stuff that come and, you know, there's not, there's just not 170 or 180 inch deer, you know, around every tree that they can, they can hunt. But you let any of those management deer get to five and six years old, they're normally always going to be at least a 150s or closer, like a 160 even. And that's a huge deer. I mean, for, for most people, even myself, when I moved down here, I mean, I, you know, I had shot maybe one deer or two deer over, you know, 170 at that time that we moved here. So, you know, as long as you shoot a, a five or six year old buck, you know, on the ground, their head is giant, their neck is giant. Even if they're like 150, is just, that's a huge deer. So most of the deer that we know are kind of management deer are never going to be 200, which is most of them. I mean, something that'll go in the 190 to 200 is one in a million. You know, you're lucky if you get, you know, two of those a year overall on all 10 farms. But, you know, you have a lot of young ones that have that potential. They see at three at three years old, but inevitably a lot of times they get killed by neighbors because, you know, uh, a good three-year-old can be 160 or 170 inches. Even you go, man, that one has the potential to go to 190 or 200. But at three years old, they're just so dumb. I mean, you know, you rattle, you grunt, they come running into your trees, and they're always on their feet and moving all over the place. Those are the ones that are most vulnerable for your neighbors, you know, to get off your property and get on your neighbors because they just wander so much at that age. But if we get them past, if we get them past three, but well, we lose very few of them because we just have, you try to buy, you know, try to buy farms that have plenty of cover that can hold a lot of deer with open fields to get a lot of food in them and, and stuff. And once they get past, you know, four to five years old, boy, they, they don't wander very far. We very rarely lose them. But, you know, most of them we'll know right away. These will never be, you know, even 170 inch deer, but still there's nothing wrong with 150 or 160 inch deer, you know? <laughs> no, I, I definitely, I, I don't know if I would personally hesitate on shooting 150 inch deer if it walked by. I mean, I'd have to know something pretty specials in the, uh, in the neighborhood for me to pass that yeah. up. But you know, yeah. it, I guess it just goes to show how serious the two of you are about, you know, deer hunting and actually managing your deer herd. So one of the things that I also want to ask you is when, when you go and let's say you're going to purchase a farm or you're going to lease a farm, what is the minimum number of acres that you guys want to look for to properly manage that farm? It can really be anything. Um, and it all depends on the location of it or what it is. We've got, um, now we tell this story, I'll shorten it up quite a bit here, but because this is next to one of ours, but there's a road between it and it's just a, you know, an old County road. It was only 60 acres. And a guy from Wisconsin had it, and he, you know, he would see that we're shooting all these good bucks, and he couldn't, you know, he was never shooting any of them, basically. He'd shoot a two-year-old or a three-year-old every year, and he's like, this is ridiculous. And it's true, a lot of people are next think, hey, I want to have a farm next to you. But that's probably not the best idea because you're probably not going to outspend us on food plots and equipment and all that stuff. I mean, I, you know, we spend so much money because we can, it's a show expense to put in these food plots and, and stuff. So you're likely not going to have as much food as us, and you're likely not going to have as much time to hunt as we do. You know, if there's a big one between the two farms, if I'm hunting every single day for that deer, and you can come out on the weekends or something out there, I'm going to shoot it anyway. So your best bet is to get, you know, next to a, a farmer or, you know, a park you can't hunt. A farmer, there's a lot of farmers that just don't hunt. They don't allow anybody to hunt. Those are the, your best neighbors. You don't want me as a neighbor. 
And he found that out. He's like, you know, I just, I'm not, I can't see anything. I watch the show and I see all these giant deer you're shooting over there. And I, cause he's gotten, you know, a few of them on camera, but he's never seen them. So he sold that to us. But, you know, right in the middle of it, it's only 60 acres, but right in the middle of it, he had like a, I don't know, it's like a 17 acre field in there that he just had in CRP. And we always said that. Like, I don't know why he just leaves that in grass and they can hold some, you know, some deer in there for bedding. But, you know, you're not going to hold them in there, you know, when we have all the food over on ours. So he sold it to us and we took that out immediately, that CRP out and planted it, you know, in a big cornfield. And I think the show has already aired this year when she shot, uh, um, what do we call him again, Tiffany? Um, you, the one you shot over on the 60 acre piece. I can't remember what the name we want. Uh, uh, Sandman. 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 Blake out. I'm like, Sandman. Yeah. Um, but see, we had a bad a drought year last year, so our big food plot that's on the north end on our side never grew. The beans never came up. They came up like three inches. There's so many deer on there, they just wiped them out. They never grew. So we put it in winter wheat, late season, like in, in August, and we still never got any rain. So you know, by the time we got any rain, I mean, it was barely up. And But the cornfield did pretty well over there because uh, we just kind of no-tilled it into, you know, it burned uh, with fires and burned that big TRP field off and then, you know, no-tilled into it. So it held quite a bit more moisture than the rest of it because we never did disc it up or anything. But that cornfield did pretty well in that little 60-acre piece. And, like, you know, late season, we got to, like, December 23rd. And, you know, before that day she shot it, and we cut a bunch of that corn. We had every single deer that we've ever seen and have never seen on our big piece on that field. We could have shot every single buck, Wally, Starbucks, I mean, Lurch, uh, Petey, every one of those bucks that we've been – you know, spending 10 years managing that farm to grow on that. We're in that little 10-acre field in the middle of that 60-acre piece. You know, so it just shows you, I'm sure, when he sees that, when Alan sees that, uh, uh, you know, that show, he's going to die, you know, because it really took me, you know, two days and maybe, you know, eight dollars $900 worth of uh, $1,000 worth of corn seed and, you know, and fertilizer to plant that, and that's all it took. Um, you know, so that's only on a, on a 60 acre piece. And of course it was next to us where we're managing, where we have a lot of old deer that we're leaving go, because even though we have a deer that we would maybe shoot that's four and five years old, that we like on that farm, we have several this year. And we just found the shed off one today and we call it round 10 and he was five this year and he was on our hit list early. But then once you shoot a couple and it gets to late season and you haven't shot him, it's like, all right, let's take him off the list. You've already shot Wally over there and we shot a couple of those management deer and said, let's just leave him. So a lot of them come off the hit list, you know, as later in the year it gets. And if you shoot a couple other deer out there. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a six-year-old deer because they're always going to get a little bit bigger. So, you know, it just goes to show you that you don't have to have a big piece. If it's, the, if it's even a small piece like that, you know, next to a place that has some, some deer in there, um, you know, and a lot of those deer bet there and we find a lot of sheds in there and everything else, but you know, heck there's uh we, we would have hundred to 200 deer in there every night. And uh, that's actually where I found that shed today was on that little 60 acre piece. So that, you know, that's turned out to be one of our better purchases, but even if we didn't have the big, you know, the, the 500 acre piece next to it, it's across a road, you know, it's just, it sits by itself, but you know, the road is, is closed. It's a, you know, um, it was an old county road, so I mean, they—it's not, you know, right up next to it. I mean, there is a road between the two, but that's only 60 acres, and we could shoot every single deer on on that piece that we have on our big piece, you know, if that's all we had. We had so, a 51 farm too that was an awesome farm. Yeah, and that's another one too that kind of butts up to one of our other ones on the corner of it. But yeah, one of our buddies shot a, a big eight point on there that we we're talking about. It was there seven or eight year old buck now and he was he'd only been he'd always just been an eight point but he's a 150 inch eight point which is an awesome deer uh you know and that's on the 51 acre piece so you don't need big pieces but you need to have you know ideally you need to have like you know eight to ten acres of you know of a food plot in there to be able to hold any number of deer in there you know if you have a couple two acre or even a one acre field you know if you have a, any kind of numbers of deer they'll eat that out right away and you won't be bringing them there consistently, you know, all throughout the whole year anyway. Now, it granted, I it 
differs region by region and where you know you happen to be at but in your neck of the woods what's what's your go-to seed for putting a food plot in well it depends yeah clover i mean if there were, if there's only one thing that we could plant it would be clover i mean it, you can put it in small food plots and it will stand a ton of grazing pressure you know through the whole summer it's 30 percent protein through the winter it doesn't freeze out like right now our clover field the deer will be digging through the snow to get at that clover so that's fact, you know but oh, right now yeah i mean we don't you don't want to go out and plant like i have 600 acres of food plots so it's like i'm not gonna plant 600 acres of clover but you know every farm will have clover fields on it but it'll also have corn it'll also have beans it'll also have canola and turnips and you know i try to get a good mixture of of things to make it last the longest amount of time but if i could only plant one thing it'd be clover for sure now, do you feel like, I mean, obviously there's pros and cons to everything you plant, but do you feel like, how would you commit, compare a clover to a canola? Well, it's totally different. Like, you know, the, the nice thing about canola, I mean, with about clover, you have it all summer. Where like for us, I mean, if you're going to harvest canola, like up in Canada, you would plant it you know, in the spring, the same time you do corn and beans, but we don't, you don't want it to go to seed. Like that's the nice thing about when you hunt in Canada, if you go up there early when it's still yellow and flowers, those deer being it like crazy. But as soon as it, the, the flowers drop and it seeds out, then there's not a deer in there. And, you know, that's usually around middle of September. So you don't want to plant it, you know, in you know April or May when you're doing corn and beans, we don't plant it until, you know, until July. And so we just kind of look and wait and see when there's some rain coming. You can plant it in August. If you plant it in July, you might get those yellow shoots to come up with the yellow flowers on it. But if you don't, even you plant it in August, it'll just be the big leafy stuff that looks kind of like rape. Um, so it's and it's 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 different as a rape, you know, where it's more starchy and they don't really eat it a lot until it freezes and that starch turns to sugars and then they'll really hit it hard. The canola is like right when it comes up, where they start eating it right away. So it's one of those things where it, can, it puts out a lot of tonnage. And you can, you know, in our mix that we do with wild game, we also put some, uh, like, forage turnips in there, too. So, you know, because that's so big and leafy on the top, so it'll withstand a lot of grazing pressure even on a small field. But then once they eat all those right down to the ground, you also have the turnip in there. So, like, this time of year, they're just digging up those turnips and stuff like crazy in those fields. So you can, you know, you can... Uh, we stand a lot more, I mean, a lot of grazing pressure, and it's something different and something for, in the wintertime, they're really, you know, it's easier for them to get at, you know, those big tops and, and the turnip where, you know, clover lasts all year. But, you know, and on the canola, you don't, it's only, it's an annual, and you got to do it every year, where, you know, clover, you, you know, we have a lot of our clover fields that last six and seven years. So that's the advantage of, clover but there's also something to be said about having that variety you know the deer like moving around and and uh you know having a big variety for them to to choose from now obviously you guys put a ton of effort into your food plots and for obvious reasons but do you guys do any type of a mineral program or anything like that there yeah i mean we in the summertime you know we'll start you know right as soon as the snow comes off and as soon as it starts thawing out here a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll have our feeders going as soon as we run out of food everywhere. And a lot of, some, a lot of the farms have already run out of food. So we get feeders going, you know, cause we can't, you can't bait, you know, during hunting season here, but once it's over, we can. And I just use that, you know, for supplemental feed to get them through the winter, but then all through the summer too, you know, they don't eat at them all that often. I mean, they're, we have a big bean field or corn field or clover field where there's beef, 50 deer out at night I usually have that's where i have my feeders just on the field edges and that's mostly just to take inventory you know if you'd have to have 50 cameras you know on the field to get every deer coming out all those trails but at least some point during the night most of them will make their way over to those those feeders and that's where i put the mineral you know the minerals out right next to the feeder as well so you know at some point in the night about every deer will come over and just take a few bites and then go back out but I'll just, it allows me to put one camera out there and, and get a good inventory of the deer that are hitting that field and not that, you know, the deer here really need 
the supplemental feed in the spring and summer. It's more just they'll always come over and take a few bites of corn, and we mix it with sugar beet crush. We have the mineral stations there, too. You know, it really allows us to take a good inventory of what we have for, you know, throughout the summer. Very good stuff. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, this is kind of the part of the show to where I actually put this out there to our listeners. Um, if they had any kind of questions for the two of you, and we got some pretty good questions here. And if you don't mind, I'd like to get started on those. Oh, good, yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, the first one here is: Do either of you have any hobbies outside of hunting? Yeah, okay. actually, I mean, we do. We love to go skiing. In fact, we would have been skiing next month, except we're having a baby next month instead. So we started skiing a few years ago, and I mean, really, it's like I love to run. You know, it's like I signed up for another half marathon this summer after we have the baby and stuff. So. But in all honesty, you know, we're gone so much that when we're actually home, we just love to be home and just puttering around. It's like, I don't think there's anything that we do now that we wouldn't be doing had we not had the show. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I, yeah, I guess and I like skiing and snowmobiling and a few things like that, but most of it has to do with deer. I mean, you know, I love all summer shooting our bows. We have a 3D, like a walk-through 3D course at our house. I like love going out and, you know, and you get those nice, cool mornings and or evenings and just go out walk through our walk through course it's beautiful out you know but most everything kind of revolves around deer the things i like doing i love getting in the tractors and plowing and planting and you know strategizing getting the dozer out and putting in new food plots oh, and you know, love to you know go fish here up in canada and stuff but yeah. really everything revolves around being outside yeah for sure no hobbies indoors everything's outside that's that's a good thing though i i think today's generation with their xboxes and stuff i i don't get the appeal to it but whatever obviously somebody does because <laughs> they make a lot of money off that stuff yep we were just talking about that with our baby it's like now they won't have any cell phones or xboxes or you know like things like that they'll have four wheelers and dirt bikes and they'll have all kinds of stuff outside but yeah when he comes in it'll be just to go to bed there you go yeah make sure i uh, get a bath and then throw them in bed cause, uh, oh, <laughs> right man. Um, this next one, and I actually, this was something that I was going to bring up to you guys, because I guess this is my, this is my opportunity to kind of pump you guys up and, um, really just congratulate you because, you know, anybody that follows you on Twitter or likes your Facebook page or, uh, anything like that, whether it be Instagram or really any type of social media, you always have, and I notice it and I, I'm not the kind of guy who's on social media all day, but the little bit that I do get on and I do experience, I noticed that there's really, I want to say there's, I don't want to call it trash talking, but I don't really know a better way to describe <laughs> it. You know, yeah. and, and I, obviously you guys know where I'm going for this or with this, oh, but yeah. you know, the way I see you guys handle these situations is you're a hundred times better than I would because <laughs> I'm the kind of guy who, you know, I, I'd take them out back. and But you guys, you always handle it with such class that, you know, it, it amazes me. So what what's your tips or what's your strategies for handling all the, you know, the basically the trash talk? And, you know, I, I've heard a million people say, oh, you guys have high fences and yada, yada, yada. But, <laughs> I mean, how do you how do you go about not letting that get to you? Well, Tiff, you want to go first on that one? Uh, well, I mean, you know, a lot of that stuff, I mean, in all honesty, I think people really, social media is like almost the devil. I mean, it's like, it's kind of a love-hate relationship that we all have to have because it's like, obviously, we have to have it. And we love to interact with our fans and stuff, but it also allows people to be able to write stuff that they have no consequence for. You know, it's like, it's easy to say, I'm like, how about you say that to my face? It's like, oh, let me guess, you would never do that. You know, it's easy for people to be a nameless, faceless person behind a computer screen. So I think, first of all, they don't really realize that we read all of that stuff. And, I mean, especially on Twitter and Instagram, I mean, I write people back all of the time. And so, I mean, for me, I get a little more frustrated than even Lee does because he's like, why are you even wasting your time with that person? I'm like, I don't know, because I just feel like everything we've ever done, we work our butts out for it. And you got some doorknob that's like, you know, you're doing high sets. I'm like, we live in Iowa, for God's sake. It's like the entire state is a food plot you know so i mean a lot of times i call people out on stuff i mean 
when it's just straight up things like that. And then, you know, a lot of our fans kind of start coming in and, you know, and they kind of get on them too. But as far as like the real straight up, like anti hunting stuff, I mean, we just have a policy. It's like, we're a little different than some other people out there. We just ban and ban and delete. We don't even address them because it's like, you know what, you're never going to get anywhere with that. And, and we don't really want that attention from that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just, anyone that says, oh, you hunt high fans or something like that. Obviously they don't watch our show because you would know. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's funny because it's like, no, if you hunt on a high fence, you'd, you'd go out for a rough three day hunt and you'd shoot a two fifty. you know, I know, but it was taking I've, me I've been three years for 40 to have years and I've yeah, been hunting for 40 years down here and I, and I still haven't shot a 200. It's like you hunted on a high fence, you'd shoot one in every three days or every three hours, depending on the place. It's like, well, if not, it's the high fence and we're, you know, the best that we can muster up there, our average is like 160 inch deer. I think that'd be most high fences two-year-olds so, I mean, obviously it's not you know uh so you just kind of laugh it off but you know like tiffany said that's our policy we don't we don't deal with you know those type of people are just jealous and those ones but you know if you get the real PETA people the anti-hunter people we just don't confront them because that's what they want they want you to start confronting them and they want you to get some reactions so we just we just don't you know we just delete and ban and you know so we don't really have a huge problem with you know you see some of the other people that have you know, 5,000 death threats a day or something. We have none of that. I think most of those anti-hunters realize that I don't even bother with Lee and Tiffany. They just, they won't engage. You know, we just delete and ban and super nice to all of them. If anyone ever said anything to me and say, I appreciate your, your opinion. And I do, I think, you know, in a free country, everyone should have their opinions. Everyone has the right to it, but you know, I don't go out and try to, you know, I don't get all over in their face trying to tell them why we should hunt. So I think, we have our opinion, you have yours, you know, I still respect you for it and let's be friends and move on, <laughs> you know? So we don't really engage them in, in things. And so we don't really have that, that kind of problem. And our show is mostly about, you know, camaraderie and just the, the fun family time that we spend together. So if anyone wants to, uh, you know, say anything's wrong with that, spending time with your family and having a good, strong marriage and relationship, that's pretty hard to, bunk right on that so we don't have a huge problem with it you're absolutely right on that and that's a that's actually a great way to put it now you know obviously you guys you do everything from what i can tell very classy you don't you know i've really i've never seen you either of you be very confrontational it's always you know it's always kind of polite and you know you handle yourselves well with that because i I see a lot of people out there that go all out, you know, I'm sorry to say it. They go all out idiot on these anti hunters. And I just can't help mm-hmm. but think to myself that maybe there's a better way to handle it. And you guys definitely. Yeah. Well, that's what they want. I mean, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for you. And it's like, I don't know. You, you hear that you can't, you can't deal with stupid people. You, you go, you bring yourself down to their level and they'll beat you with experience. So, well, you just and that mention. And- it's like, you know, Lee and I have like 21 nieces and nephews, and it's like no different than the stuff I tell them when I look on their Facebook pages. It's like, you cannot take it back once it's out on social media. So it's like, you always just have to conduct yourself with class and, you know, responsibility. It's like, you know, my mom might be reading it. Lee's dad might be reading it. It's like, you know, you just got to be, you just got to be smart with your posts and stuff because it's like, once it's out there, you're not getting it back. We got a lot of people you know, who I feel like look up to us, including, like I said, our nieces and nephews. And it's like, well, I can't really lecture them if I'm doing the absolute thing of lecturing about on social media. So, Right. And because most of these people, I mean, you know, most people are good people. If you met them on the street or met them someplace, I'm sure you could be friends with just about anybody, you know. And and it's like, you know, when I I typically say when there's a nameless Facebook person behind the screen, it's like, you know, it's not even, you know, if someone writes your face, starts arguing with you or something, you might say something back, you, you know, or just argue your point. But on, on social media, it's not even, it's not even worth. Really worth I, mean, I barely look at. It. I got so many things going on, so much work to do on our farm and stuff. I don't, I don't, you know, bother myself with it. You know, a lot of times at night I'll sit down and read through them, and you know, there's a lot of stuff that gets you mad, and you're like. That's ridiculous. But, you know, I never respond to them or anything. I know. It's so funny because people are like, why don't you and Lee have separate accounts? And I'm like, are you kidding? Because, A, Lee would never be on his. And (laughs) I always laugh. I'm like, because B, we're married. It's like, why would we have separate accounts? 
That's yeah. funny. Typical, typical guy right there. I don't think I would have Facebook if I had the option, but I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> I'm with you, Lee. I, I'm, I'm happy. I'll go tune a bow or something like that and just whatever. Yeah. Get out. Um, yeah. I mean, I sit and talk gear all day. If somebody wants to talk about it, there, you know, if somebody was, you know, sometimes I'll get down there and somebody asks a legitimate question and there's a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of people that, I mean, there's a lot of great people. I mean, the thing is you got, you know, whatever, 600,000 likes on there. I mean, most 99% of people are awesome. And, you know, it's just the 10%. I'm sure it's the same ones that are on ours and Waddell's and the Eva Shockies and everyone that, that are the big mouths and stuff. And it's like, you know, for those very few people like that, it's not worth your time, but that's what they want is for someone to engage with them. And so we just yeah. never do. Yeah, I feel it's almost like a hobby to some people. Right? Yeah, I agree. Um, yep, for sure. So, you know, once again, my hat's off to you guys for handling that the way you do. And, you know, you guys are always, you're in the spotlight 24 seven in the outdoor industry. And, you know, you're, you get your, your, whatever you want to call it, your clout from your TV show. But is there ever a time to where, you know, both of you or either one of you separately, do you ever get to just go outside and hunt without a camera following you? Go ahead, Tiff. Um, well, no, but you know what? See, my situation is a little different because I've never even shot anything off a of film. You know, it's like because Lee always filmed me. But I tell you, the thing is, it's like you see so many neat things that it would almost be like heartbreaking that the one time you go out there without a cameraman or something or a camera, you'd be like, "Be the coolest thing in the world," that you would have it on video. But really, it's like it doesn't it doesn't bother us a bit because it's not like it's a big production. It's like they're there to capture what we got going on and. I mean, the thing that we do do that is, like, still kind of fun, like, old school is, like, we'll go out and just hunt together and film each other. And that's, like, kind of almost to the point of where we don't have, like, cameras with us because it's, like, no cameraman. It's just Lee and I out there. In fact, Lee filmed me shoot two deer this year, which is which is kind of funny. You know, it's, like, all these guys, all of our camera guys with Wally, I mean, they filmed me for years with Wally and encounter after encounter and after encounter. And, and then Lee goes out there and films the kill, which is, which is just hilarious, but it's like, that's what we like sometimes out there, you know, but I mean, to go out without a camera, you know, I, it doesn't, it's just so uninterfering anyways, you know what I mean? It doesn't even bother me to have those guys with, I mean, those guys are like our best friends too. It's like, I'd almost be like, I really don't have anybody to talk to out here. I'm like, Whew, what am I going to do for the next three hours? Yeah. So it doesn't bother yeah. me a bit actually. Yeah, me either. And you know, people have asked, I mean, since we started this 10 years ago, people have asked you that. Don't you ever just go out and you ever just going out without a camera? I'm like, no, because, I mean, I always went out. That's how we got into this. I mean, it, every time I went out, I always had a camera, and now, heck, you can bring your phone. Back then, I had these giant VHS cameras that had to put it mount up on your shoulder, hanging that <laughs> thing up in the tree and stuff. That is not that I was ever thought for a TV show. I just loved seeing stuff. If I were skid deer and that you're willing to shoot and get video footage of it, I'd go home and watch this thing until the tape wore out, and I still do. I mean, I got to... Everything and we shoot. I got them on my phone. I look at them 25 times a day. And yeah. If I were to go out and shoot a good deer, or even see some a good buck fight, or see something cool, and I didn't have a camera, I'd be you. sick about it. I'd be sick about it. So it's, it's like when you have a baby or something like, like we're gonna have here. It'd be like not having a video camera or pictures of it. It's just you know, for me, the, the cameras with are, you know, just a, you know, we have it, you know the rest of our lives on film, you know, those hunts that, that we were on. So it's just like documenting it in a scrapbook for myself. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to go out without a camera because I'd be afraid I'd see something really cool or something that I could never see again or show my friends or, you know, show Tiffany or whatever, what happened. So it's certainly, like Tiffany said, they our camera guys are our best friends too. And we're great teams together. And it's always fun to go out with them and even to share those experiences, even if it's just Tiffany and I in the stand or, you know, you know, Jeff Lovin is guys with me all the time, and Mark Woolley's with Tiffany all the time. I mean, we've gotten to be there, our closest friends, too. So it's almost, you know, it makes it more fun going out and hunting with somebody, you know, than by yourself now. My possum wasn't on film, though, just so you know. Well, I was yeah. just going to ask what episode would the possum kill be on, but <laughs> just, you just yeah. answered that. Yeah. Uh, but I got to witness it with my eyes, so. <laughs> Well, you know what? You guys have to start your own possum hunting show then because obviously you're getting pretty <laughs> good at it. No, oh, we could get yeah, good at that. Yeah, no, it wasn't real stealthy. <laughs> I won't mention that I took you three shots before she shot him, but 
the handgun's a little bit more difficult than a ball. <laughs> well, that, that's understandable. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't even have an excuse. I'm like, oh, well, what do you do? <laughs> At least it's dead, though. I mean, that's that's the important thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I got him, right? Now, obviously, you guys are you're known for your white tail and you're known for killing big white tail, but is there any animal other than a white tail that is your absolute favorite to hunt? Elk. Yep. Same here. Elk is my, my favorite. Well, that was, that was a really easy question. All right. Well, yep. <laughs> that, I mean, that took yeah. literally three seconds. So apparently that's well, definitely I mean, the it's answer. It's just like hunting giant turkeys. It's like, you know, I mean, it's, in all honesty, when we go out elk hunting, because we started to do a lot of stuff with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation the last few years, and we'll go out elk hunting for almost a month early season before our season opens, and it is actually really hard to come back home and sit in a tree stand for, like, the first few weeks because you're like, wait, we're not, we're not going to go after them? We're not going to go get them? I mean, you know, it's hard to sit still. It's like elk hunting is just so much fun. You know, you hear them bugle, you go after them. Like I said, it's like turkey hunting, you know, it's just. And then when they bugle like that, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. It's turkey it's hunting right. with a giant prize. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. <laughs> that's a that's a great way to put it. Yeah, it's I I always have a hard anytime we do any type of spot and stock, and then I go sit in a tree the next day. It's like you look at your phone. It's like what the heck? It's only been thirty seconds. It's like oh my god, I know it, it just <laughs> drags. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an adjustment period for us. We start August eighteenth. And we go like this year. I went through till August or October fifth. So, you know, you're looking at almost two months straight of you know, every day spot and stock and and stuff. And uh, then you go sit in the tree. It's a big. It's a. It's a big, big adjustment. Change. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, Tiffany, you have a little bun in your oven, so to speak. But uh, mm-hmm. do you have any plans of taking any time off once you have the baby? Um, I mean, right now is kind of our time off. I mean, once we have them, we'll start turkey hunting. And, I mean, we're just so lucky because we live in Iowa. So it's like, you know, right away we plan on having them out in the blind with us, you know, with our bows. And, I mean, really it's just going to be just no different than our dogs, just part of everything that we do every day. You know, it's like we've already got our hunts planned. Coming up here, he's on all of our hunts with us, and we have places that we go that we can bring him and our bus and, a partridge in a pear tree because that's going to be basically what it is because we'll have our dogs there. It's like we'll have my mom there. It's like so it, it'll definitely be a little bit of adjustment, but you know we're kind of just getting right back to it. In all honesty, yeah. Whoa. I mean, you think that he's if the due date is March twentieth, but you know even if it goes a little later than that, I mean our season, our turkey season opens and uh, like on the tenth or eleventh of April. We get so a couple weeks a, where we'd have you know, nothing, be a week but or then. Two. And yeah. then, you know, we'll be turkey hunting. So we'll have him out with us. But then on, like, May 21st, we'll go to Vancouver Island, spot and stock black bear hunting. And then we come back, you know, from that. And then in July, we always do our Canada fishing trip. So it'll be, he'll be, and then what, if we have another whitetail hunt in Alberta, he'll be to Canada three times before he's eight months old. Yeah. You got to get him some frequent flyer miles or something. Good Lord. <laughs> I know it, right? Yeah, he'll be racking them up good. But like I said, I mean, for us, I mean, you know, it's just, like I said, we always just, no different than our dogs. They just came with us and everything, and he'll be the same thing. He'll be the same way. Well, that's awesome. He's definitely going to have a uh, childhood worth remembering, that's for sure. But um, another quick question, obviously, you know, no surprise, uh, baby topic-wise, but do you have any names picked out for the baby or any ideas? Go ahead, me. Yep. <laughs> well, this one, you know, not that it couldn't change. We have a few, but... We uh, have three names that we're down to. We, we like the name Benjamin, we like the name Cameron, and we like the name Mark. Marcus, yeah. So yep. right now it's Cameron, you know, because everyone's like, oh, you should name him Bo Hunter and all this stuff. Like, well, that would be kind of, uh, you know, you would expect that. So I feel like Cameron Lee, Lee would be his middle name. You know, I figure, hey, you know, if you shorten it down to Cam Lee, at least his Cam's on a bow. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's, at least it's somewhat to do, can can be to do with, with a bow or archery. So Cam Lee is, is the front runner at this point. It's better than naming him like uh... – knock or something like that so uh good good job with that Um, and then one last question here is obviously you guys are you guys have probably the best land to deer hunt on um 
So, how do you deal with trespassers? Do you get a lot of them? Do you? We just shoot them. That... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll edit that out. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, no, you know, we don't really have much of a problem with, with trespassers. Um, and mostly because we do like the most, of, most of the people around, we know who the poachers are. They know us. And like, it's like everything. We're nice to everybody. Good to everybody. Help everybody out. And, uh, you know, most people know that we've got, you know, like we talked about the three, 400 cameras out. And now that well, we yeah, got those a lot new of the, cell eight cameras, those the things new cell are cameras clutch. out that you get the pictures immediately. Um, you know, that's it's kind of a showstopper. Um, and it's not like, you know, we're from out of state and, and you know, we come down on the weekends or two weekends a year or something. And most of the people will know that kind of stuff. And we're out every single day someplace, you know. And uh, so they know pretty much it was between us being there and the cameras, it's not worth it. And, you know, one of the, Matt, one of the guys that works for us, used to work for the sheriff's department, but he still does. He still does his just so he can stay, you know, on the – on the forest, he has he works in whatever it is, the two weekends a month and one week or two weeks a year. So he still is a bad carrying sheriff, you know. So him and his best friend is our game warden. So, you know, they kind of in the off season really patrol our stuff and watch it and keep track of it and, and everything too. And most of the locals know that, you know, they do, you know, when we first moved here anyway, they put out the decoys and do sting operations on our, farms and stuff but most people know now that we're here all the time i mean we're someplace every day and you know so, so even if you're just tiffany and i hunting but you know we have our guests and and you know some there's five of us you know two of tiffany's cousins and one of my buddies that that own all the property so they're usually down there's always somebody someplace so i think for a lot of the locals they realize hey, it's not worth it you know there's parks and other farmers that don't want to hunt and everything that's you know, it's just we're gonna poach or something to go over there because the odds of getting caught at our place are pretty good between us being there and the cameras and all the cell cameras and, and everything it's, it's pretty tough to get away with it you know at this point so we really don't have much problem with it well that's that's a good thing and i i know just as you know having personal property that there's nothing more frustrating than trespasses other than you know, spooking a deer, that's that's right up there too. But um trespassing to me just oh, it drives me crazy and it it's good to hear that people actually respect you guys enough to stay off your property because I'm sure there's a little bit of temptation. Oh, we have our problems. Yeah. So we have our problems and actually in all honesty, we have more problems with people trying to shed hunt on our place, like stealing shed, which is crazy than even deer stuff, but I mean yeah, I think they figure there that, you know, hey, we don't have a gun, we're not hunting, we can just pay without walking, wherever that is not as severe, but we catch most of them, too. I mean, the cameras. Yeah, we do, actually, amazingly enough. Because even, even people that have stolen cameras, I mean, we have 50 on every farm, they might, you know, they always miss some. So then it's, it's even worse for them, because, you know, like I said, we know who they are around here. It's not like there's a lot of people that come from out of town, you know, you just... I just hand the cards over to, to Matt and bring them to the sheriff's department. They identify the guys, they go get them, and then they got them for stealing cameras and, and everything, too. So, I mean, you know, you live in a small town. That goes around like wildfire. You know, you, you catch a few people, and uh, pretty soon they learn, you know, it kind of goes around, hey, you better stay out of there. So it's not so much that people respect it too much. I think it's more they just think the chance of getting caught are fairly high, so they don't they don't bother with it. I mean, now sitting on the fences and, shooting over the fence so that's another story but you know you got ways to take care of that too so absolutely well that's good stuff and i you know thank you so much for coming on and uh joining us here this is our 200th episode so we really really appreciate it um but i will talk awesome. to you guys soon thank you for coming on thanks well, for having us thanks for having us That's episode 200 in the books. Once again, big thank you to Lee and Tiffany Lukoski and also to Backwoods Life for bringing you guys this episode. Uh, listeners, thank you so much for sticking with us through these 200 episodes, and we really, really appreciate everything you do here at FMP Bowcast. So uh, on behalf of everybody here, thanks a lot, guys.